Church, praise God. Welcome back. Welcome back. So nice to see everybody again. It's hot out there today and a little warm in here. So pardon me if I start glistening. Of course, I, I guess that's the proper thing to say now is glisten instead of sweat. I'm trying to be a little bit more proper for the audiences on YouTube. We got a fancy new camera today. So if I look better, it's because we have a fancy new camera. All right. So Today we are going to be talking about a little bit of a lighter subject. We're going to be talking about prayer, specifically the anatomy of prayer. We're going to break it down and, and see what it's all about. So has anybody ever asked you, or maybe have you ever thought about this, what would you say if somebody asked you what is prayer? How would you describe prayer? Has anybody ever asked you that before? Have you ever asked yourself that before? Now the most common answer I get is, well, praying is when you want something from God. You pray and you get it. So it's a very, very vague answer. But this kind of answer displays a certain mindset of the person. And that mindset typically causes prayers to go unanswered. Because prayer and prayer life, it's, it's, it's part of the Christian walk. It is a huge part of the Christian walk. Okay, So the reason why that mindset, when you say it's just something you do to get something you want, it makes God sound like a piggy bank. Okay, that's not what he is. He's not an ATM. He's not a piggy bank. He doesn't work like that. But this type of mindset causes prayers to be spoken out of desperation, out of fear, out of hopelessness, out of, uh, I mean, a need, yes, but a need coming from the wrong side of it. Many of your heart's not right when you're doing the prayer. So God doesn't answer these types of prayers, and he doesn't answer these types of prayers for two reasons. It's very important that you do know how to pray. So the first reason is you could be praying from the wrong spirit. You could be praying for the wrong spirit if you're coming to God. And our scripture, first scripture is going to be in 2 Timothy 1 at 7. It says, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So how do we tie this scripture into prayer? Well, first of all, having a sound mind means you're, you have discipline, you have self-control. It also means you're sane and you're rational. So if your prayers are not based on the foundation of God's power, his love and his peace, then more likely they're based on fear, on hopelessness and desperation, which is the exact opposite of faith. So we know that God only responds to faith. So when you pray, your prayers have to be full of faith. Coming to uh, God in, in, in desperation and not knowing who you are in Christ could make it or break it of whether or not your prayers get answered. Thank God for his mercy. But there is a way to pray, and we're going to talk about that today. Now, the second reason God wouldn't answer a prayer other than praying from the wrong spirit, if you're praying from a spirit of fear um, or, or anything like that, that wouldn't get answered because it's not based on faith. But what's the second thing? Well, the second thing is faith, right? Because God only responds to faith. Now, look at Hebrews 11 and 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and he is a rewarder that diligently seek him. So when we go in prayer, we come to God in prayer. So if we're coming to God, we must come in faith. We must come in faith and believing in what we're asking for. So if prayer is not simply asking God for something you need, then what is it? Really, what is prayer? Because most people only have that understanding of what prayer it is. Well, according to Webster's Dictionary, prayer is asking a favor an earnest request or entreaty, a petition. Okay, It is also the act of addressing supplication to a divinity, especially to the true God. Now, this is Webster's Dictionary. You go to the modern urban dictionary, they don't say stuff like this. This is the Webster's 1800 and something edition that honored God and believed in God. Newer, newer ones today, they take that element completely out of it. Just wanted to throw that in there. So it's the offering of adoration, confession, supplication, and thanksgiving, which is gratitude, to the supreme being, which is our God, our Lord and Savior. Now, it's also the forming of words used in prayer, a formula, it says. Now, keep that in your back pocket, a formula of supplication and express petition, especially a supplication addressed to God. Now, it said supplication a few times in there. I wonder if that has any relevance. Well, let's look. Supplication means to make a humble and earnest request to pray to God. To make a humble 
an earnest request to pray to God. So already we're transforming the generic, you know, oh, God's a piggy bank. I just come to him when I need something. Now we're changing that. We're giving some depth to what prayer means. So when we, sub up, when we sum, up, sum up Webster's Dictionary, uh, uh, as far as the definition of prayer, it sounds like this. It says, prayer is a humble and gratitude-filled request to God during a time of need. So now we're getting a better idea of what prayer is. It's a humble and gratitude-filled request to God during a time of need. Now we're always in need of the Lord, but it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. So when we pray, we pray from the mindset that Christ in us, the hope of glory is living us. We pray from the mindset that we have victory in the name of Jesus. But most people don't associate prayer with that um, right believing because we're now a new creation created in Christ for good works. We have all power and authority in his name and all this stuff is a part of prayer. But if you never know that, then you could be praying from the wrong spirit. You could be praying from fear. You could be praying from desperation. You can be praying out of just, just the wrong motivation in general. Now, let's look at this next scripture here because this definition right here, just based on Webster's Dictionary, sounds a lot like scripture. Philippians 4, 6, it says, be careful for nothing. Be careful means to don't be anxious. So be anxious for nothing, but in everything, but by prayer and supplication, supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This particular way is also how King David prayed. Look at Psalms 143. It says, hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my supplications in thy faithfulness, answer me and in thy righteousness. So in this prayer of David's, you can see faith, you can see humbleness, and you can see thankfulness all in there. Now, it kind of makes you wonder if this is how our prayers should be organized. We should have these elements in there, in our prayers. Can't just go up to God and, and treat him like a piggy bank. It just doesn't work with that. He wants relationship, right? So now I'm going to look at those same words we just looked up. We're going to look at them in the same fashion, but we're going to look at them out of a different dictionary. We're going to look at Strong's Concordance, which is our biblical dictionary. So let's look at supplication. This is actually the Hebrew word tehina, which is uh, 8467. It means an earnest request for favor and grace. Now compare that to humble and an earnest request from the previous definition. Prayer, tefillah, means intercession, supplication. Okay, now this is, we're getting a little bit deeper in here to what prayer is. Now, the Holy Spirit told me to look up the root word of prayer, which is pray. Now, we're always, I'm going back to, to the Hebrew words here, but when you actually look up the root word of prayer, which is pray, and you look that up in the Hebrew, look at what it says. It says to judge, to judge by extension to intercede. Now, isn't that something weird to have in a prayer, the word judge? Like, what? Why would judge be in prayer? I thought judge was, was me asking for something. Well, it is. You're asking God to intercede for you, but you're also asking him to do something else. So watch this. We're going to put all these definitions together. Now, check this out. This is what this sounds like. Prayer is a humble and gratitude-filled request to God, asking him to intercede on our behalf and judge in our favor during a time of need. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? Right? Amen? So this is a relationship right here, guys. Prayer is all about relationship. It's all about God. It's all about ask, asking him, but asking him from a heart that you're my father and you take care of me and I love you and I just know that you got me. It comes from, praying comes from a position of knowing who you are in Christ, knowing who your Father is, okay? So let's add a little bit more depth to this. We're going to look at, at Philippians 4, 6 again. Now look at this. Philippians 4 and 6. So be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So prayer, the definition of prayer in Philippians is actually different than the one we just looked at. This is a different word because when I were in the New Testament, so now we're looking at Greek words, right? So prayer in this instance means something different. It means to worship and to pray earnestly. Now we're really starting to change this a little bit, okay? We're asking God to judge and intercede on our behalf, but now it's the definition of prayer is completely different in the Greek. It means to worship and to pray earnestly. And that's right here in Philippians 4, 6. Now look at what supplication says. It says to seek earnestly. So in other words, prayer is an act of worship to God. Prayer is an act of worship 
to God. Has anybody ever thought that that's what prayer is? It's an act of worship. It's something that glorifies God, especially if you're praying from a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. It doesn't glorify God in prayer if you're praying from fearfulness, if you're praying for, from anything other than faith. Prayer is an, a vital tool, a vital tool to the, to the Christian. It's absolutely necessary. We can't function in this world without prayer. We absolutely need prayer. So it's very important that you understand how prayer breaks down. You understand the anatomy of it and what it actually is involved in it. So in other words, prayer is an act of worship towards God. But why? Why is prayer an act of worship towards God? Because sincere prayer is an act of worship that reveals your love, your trust, and your faith in God to help you in your time of need. Prayer shows how much you trust God. And the reason why many people's prayers fail is because they don't trust God. They don't believe He's going to do what His Word says He's going to do. So they have no faith. So they cannot activate the promises that are clearly written in the Word of God. Prayer is an absolutely powerful tool. And many, all of you in here has witnessed how powerful prayer is. Prayer moves mountains. But you got to pray from faith. You got to know who your father is. You got to know who you are in Christ. And you got to know your rights as a son or a daughter of Christ. You got to know you have rights. The devil does not have right to trample on you. And you have to know that. Okay? So now that we know how precious prayer is, let's address some common questions. Do I have to pray? Now, why would somebody ask this? Well, somebody might say, oh, you know what? I'm good, man. I don't need God could be a Christian who's rich. Say, I'm good, man. I don't need to pray. I don't, I don't need no pray. I don't need to pray. I'm good. So what does the Bible say? Well, in Luke 18 and 1, it says, Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not faint. So we're always to pray. That means there's never a time in our life where we should not be praying. So we should always pray and not faint. Look at the second one here in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says to pray without ceasing. So if we ask somebody asks you the question, should I pray? Well, no, I'm, I'm good. I don't need nothing from God. I said, and? Jesus said we should pray. We should always pray. Paul said we should pray without ceasing. So why are you not praying? So in Luke, the word said that we should always pray right and not faint. But what does that mean? What does it mean by not faint? Look at this. It means to be utterly spiritless, wearied, or exhausted. In other words, you got, you got to pray with motivation. You kind of say, oh God, yeah, um, I think I, yep, I need this. Okay, amen. That, that's weary. That's, a, that's utterly spiritless. When you pray, you pray from a position of power. When you're praying and you're moving from a position of power, you can feel it in your words. How many of you have had me lay hands on you before? How many of you have had me pray for you? How many of you feel power in my words and what I'm saying, right? That's what it means. That's the opposite of faint, to have power in your spoken words. And the reason why my spoken words have power, because I believe what I'm saying. I believe what the Lord writ has written down in his word. And when I prayed, I prayed from a position like, I know this is how it's supposed to be, God, and I'm not going to take it any other way. When you pray, that's what your prayers sound like. That means I trust my Father. That means I trust God. That means I know He's got my back. He, that means that I know that the moment these words leave my mouth, it's done in the name of Jesus. Amen? That's what prayer is. Okay? So not only does the Lord require us to pray without ceasing, but He also expects us, expects us to put our whole heart and soul into it. All of it. Everything we got. So what are we supposed to pray for? If we're, if we're good and we're doing good, so what do we need to pray for? Well, look at this. In James 5.16, it says, pray for one another. So you know that if you're doing, no good, you're doing good, look for someone to pray for. I'm sure there's somebody out there who has a need that needs hands laid on or needs to be prayed for. So always fill a need. You always want to make sure that you are doing your job as a Christian. Christians are known by their love. Go find somebody who needs some love, man, and pray on them. What else does it say? Look at Matthew 5.44. It says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that would despisely use you and persecute you. So, we pray for everybody, and that just doesn't mean for the people you like. That doesn't mean just for, for people who are okay in your book. You've got to pray for people that hate you, people who are spitting on you, people who are trying to persecute you. You've got to pray for everybody. Everybody, good and bad. You don't, we don't sit there. We don't judge them. We don't qualify them. We pray for them because that's our job. That's how we show our love. 
uh, what benefit is it, it to us if we love people who love us back? It's much, much harder to love people who hate us. That's where God's identity is revealed through you. That's where the love of Christ is revealed in the Christian when you are loving the unlovable. Amen? So we know we're supposed to pray for one another and we pray for our enemies. Now look at this next one here. We're going to look at 1 Timothy. It says, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in a position of authority. So we make prayer, supplications, intercessions, and giving of thanks are made on behalf of all men, for kings, for queens, for everybody who is in a position of authority. Why? So that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. How many people are not praying for the president right now? How many people are just bashing him and complaining about him? And they, and they do it all in the name of Christianity. They say they're Christians, but they are obviously not doing their part because they're not praying for our president. You know, we're not, we're not supposed to sit to judge whether he's right or wrong. We're supposed to pray for him because if our president is in error, it's our prayers that are going to help lift him up and get him out of errors. But if all we're doing is condemning him and talking smack about him, number one, we're wrong with God. And number two, we're not helping anybody. All we're doing is stirring strife. All we're doing is stirring the pot. And God specifically says that strife is abomination to him. Anybody who sows strife is considered an abomination. So if we're not praying for the people who are in a position of leadership, even our local community, pray for the, pray for the sheriff's department, you know, pray for the DPS, pray for the judges, pray for everybody that they would walk in righteousness and true holiness. Why? Because our prayers make a difference. If nobody's praying for them, then the devil's is going to have his way in them. I'm not going to sit here and let people take over this town. I'm not going to let the devil take over this town. You better believe that I'm going to pray for everybody in this town because I want this town to yield 100% to the Lord. I want this town to be known for their love of Christ, for their brotherly love, to lift each other up and not tear each other down. And our prayers are what does that. Everybody understand? Amen. It's very important that we pray on a regular basis because it's pleasing to God. So... Why else does he want us to pray for people? Well, look at this next scripture, 1 Timothy 2.4. It says, this is the extended, uh, the extended portion of this next verse. It says, for who will have all men to be saved? So we pray for these kings and queens of people in a position of leadership because he wants all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So God wants everybody to be saved. He doesn't want anybody to get thrown into the lake of fire. He wants everybody to go in the rapture. He wants everybody to be saved, everybody to know Jesus. But also he wants to make it very, very clear right here in this last verse that there is one mediator between God and man. One mediator, the man Jesus Christ. Not Mary, not the saints, not Buddha, not Muhammad, not any of those guys. Nobody is the mediator between us and God. Jesus is the only one. Because of the blood of Jesus, because of Jesus Christ in us, we are able to go straight to the throne room and make our prayers made known to God. And when we sin, what happens? Jesus, our advocate, goes on our behalf and says, hey, I paid the price for that sin with my blood. They're good to go. Why? Why does he do that? So we don't get hung up on the past. We don't get hung up on the things we've done wrong. We're able to look forward. Paul says, I never look back. I only look forward. And the reason why you look forward is to keep Jesus in front of you. Keep the blinders in front of you. Keep your eyes set on God. That way you're always praying and interceding for people and not caught up by the garbage in the world and not caught up by the thing, something you did 40 years ago or 30 years ago that's still haunting you because you've never forgiven that person or the person's never forgiven you, whatever it may be, we're supposed to let go of all that emotional garbage, cast all our cares upon the Lord because He cares for us and do our job. And one of our jobs as a Christian is prayer. Prayer is there to benefit you and to benefit the body of Christ. It is your most valuable asset, the most valuable tool, the most valuable weapon you could ever have in your arsenal. Prayer is an absolute must if you're going to be victorious victorious as a Christian, victorious for the kingdom of God. If you really want to make a dent in this world, if you really want to glorify God, then prayer is an act of worship that glorifies Him. But when you're praying from power, you're praying from a position like, I know, that's how we're supposed to pray. So, what exactly are you supposed to pray for if you're doing good? Let's go back, Philippians 4, 6 again. This time I'll put it on there, I missed it the first time. 
Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests made known to God. Everything. He says you pray for everything. There is nothing too small, too insignificant for God. God cares about every single detail in your life. Every detail in your life. You should pray about everything. Why? Because you want God involved in everything in your life. Everything. You don't want to just pray for little stuff. Oh, I don't want to. I've heard people say, I don't want to trouble God with that. You know, it's just, I, I got it. No, that's not your job to, to have it. It's his job to have it. It's his job to intercede in your life. But if you keep pushing God out and don't let him in because because you're so prideful and think you can do it on your own, guess what happens? Everything starts falling apart. Why? Because we're too prideful to let God in. He wants to be involved in every detail, every facet of your life. He doesn't care how small the detail is or how grand it is. It's all the same to him because he is our father, because he is our God. He loves us so much that he's careful about every single detail, every single detail, every single hair on your head. He knows it all because he loves us that much. So let's do that, right? Let's get involved in that prayer. Let's, let's give our heart. Let's glorify God in what we do and, and, and pray to Him and, and, ed, and, let, and edify people through prayer. And let's just be the prayer warriors we're supposed to be because it glorifies Him. So God wants us to pray for every reason, right? Well, here's one specific reason. If you can't find any other reason to pray, you should always be praying for Jerusalem, for God's people. Psalm 122 and 6. It says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They prosper that lovely. You always want to pray for God's people. They are the apple of his eye, and he loves them. And if you remember, in Genesis, Genesis 12, 3, God said, um, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Talking about Jerusalem, those are God's people, the apple of his eye. So when we bless God's people, he blesses us in return. And that's just how it works. So we always want to be blessed. We want to take every opportunity to be a blessing. So here's a good one. Here's another question that people have about prayer. Will God answer my prayers? This is a big one. A lot of people truly believe that God doesn't answer all prayers. And they're right. It's for a reason that God doesn't answer all prayers. Okay? And we're going to talk about those reasons here. But when, prayer, when prayers are prayed correctly, the answer to all of God's promises is yea and amen. God will never negate his word. God will never go back on something he said. Okay, so if you're praying something and you didn't get it, something, something's wrong, something's messed up. And guess what? It's not God. It's something we did. And that's a good thing because our God is perfect. He's constant and he's always there for us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. Right. Amen. Now look at this next one. Matthew 7, 7. It says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find it. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives and he that seeks Fine, so you have to ask to receive, you have to seek so you can find, and to him that knocks, it shall be opened. Do you see that there's a part here? There's a part that we have to do, and the response is, God says, okay, 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 but we have to do our part first, okay? We have to ask, we have to seek, and we have to knock, meaning we have to make an effort. It's not just going to fall on our lap. Prayer is something we're involved in with God. It's a mutual relationship. It is a working partnership with our Father who loves us, Okay? Now look at this next verse, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. It says, therefore, I say to you, whatever things you desire, it says, whatever things, okay, you desire. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now here's the key right there. He says, whatever you want, he says, believe that you'll receive it and you will have it. It says, believe. If you don't believe for what you're praying for, guess what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. You have to believe. And what you're praying for. You can't just give empty words. Words with no power make a very ineffective prayer. Everybody get what I'm saying? Now look at this. Hebrews 4, 6. He says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So these three scriptures reveal that God does indeed answer prayers. Okay? And he says if we do our part, he'll do his part. Okay? But... What about those prayers that have not been answered? What happened? What happened? Now, there are three things specifically that could potentially negate your prayers. The first one is revealed in Hosea 4.6. It says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And my people perish for the lack of knowledge. You get what I'm saying? My people perish for the lack of knowledge. It was so good, had to put it on there twice, apparently. So what does he mean by that? The lack of knowledge can cause your prayers to go unanswered. Why? 
why can a lack of knowledge cause your prayers to go unanswered? Because you can't believe for what you don't know. You can't believe and have faith for what you don't know. If there's a certain promise in the Word of God that's available to you, and it just happens to be what you're suffering in your natural life, if you don't know that Jesus paid for that with His blood, how can you claim it when you don't know you have it? If your will says you're a millionaire and your dad left you a will and you're this millionaire but you're living like a bum on the streets begging for money, if you don't know your will says you're a millionaire, you're always, you're always going to be broke. You have to know what's in the Word of God. You have to know what's in your will. This is your will. The will and testament Jesus left to us. And it was put into effect when he died. A, a, a testament, a will, does not come into power until the testator dies. Jesus has died and he's been resurrected. And now we have his will in our hands. This is our legal document. The word of God is our legal document. It says, no, devil, I get to have this. I don't have to be broken, busted. I don't have to be sick. I, I don't have to sit here and put up with this from you. Because the Bible tells me so. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, devil, I rebuke you. You get out of here. I stand on the word of God right now in the name of Jesus. And here's my prayer, my confession of faith. Back off. When you pray like that from a position of power, guess what happens? The devil takes off running. And you have that that you have asked for. You have what you have prayed for. So the lack of knowledge will hinder your prayers from coming to pass. So what else? Well, the second thing is forgetting to consider God's will. This is a big one. Look at 1 John 5.14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, because before it said anything, but this one's saying anything according to His will, He hears us. So we know a lot of prayers, they don't get heard. Why? Because we're not asking according to God's will. So He doesn't even hear them. And if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire to Him. So if we know that we're asking according to God's will, we know that He hears us, number one, and He says that we will have what we have asked for. That is so reassuring. That is a guarantee that God will answer your prayer. So what do you have to do? You've got to find out His will. How do you find out His will? Right there in the Word of God. You look it up. You read it. Now what's the third thing? that can hinder you from having your prayers answered. The third thing is the motivation of your heart. Look at James 4.3. It says, you ask, talking about prayer, you ask in prayer, but you receive nothing. Why? Because you ask amiss. Amiss, that means you're asking the wrong way, that you may consume it upon your lust. So basically, this person he's talking about in here, he says they don't have anything they ask of God because they're asking it from a spirit of lust. They're asking from the wrong spirit. They're asking from the wrong motivation. Their heart is not right before God. And so they're not going to have what they had prayed for. They're probably saying, oh God, I hate that guy. Just, just smite him and kill him. But what's God's will? That all men should come to repentance and trust in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's something that we have to consider and put in check every single day is our heart. We've got to make sure that our heart is right before God. So when we pray, our motivation must be pure and according to God's will. So let's look at a few examples of God's will in prayer since we are on that subject. Let's talk specifically about health and prosperity. That's a pretty pro uh, popular one, right? So health and prosperity, what's God's will for that? John 3, 1, and 2. It says, Beloved, I wish above all things, I mean above everything else, this is what I want for you, that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. There's the catch right there. Did you catch that? He says, above all things, I want you to prosper and to be in health. But your soul has to prosper first. Your soul prospers by you growing in the word of God, by you knowing the promises that are written in the book, by you having a relationship with your father. That's how you prosper your soul. So he's saying, I want you to prosper and be in health, but you've got to have to prosper your soul. You've got to know what's in your will. You've got to know what the word of God says. You have to be able to apply it in your life with Conviction. I mean, you have to believe what you're praying for. So everything always goes back to the Word of God. You having a successful prayer life always goes back to you knowing the Word. And for you of saying the Word with gusto, with power, with conviction, with belief, with faith. With faith. Amen? So look at this. That particular scripture, God promises both prosperity and healing. Look at the next ones in Proverbs 13 and 22. It says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for who? 
for us, for the just. Okay, now that's an awesome thing. Okay, God would cause the wealth of the sinner to be passed on to the just. And that's in this lifetime. What good is that going to do us up in heaven? We already have everything. This is in this time for us right now. Okay, now look at what the word wealth means here. That's the Hebrew word. I'm not even going to try to say that, but it means a force of strength, might, efficiency, riches, goods, substance, virtue, and valor. A force, meaning it's something to be reckoned with. I mean, this is a blessing of of strength, a blessing of might, a blessing of efficiency, a blessing of riches, a blessing of goods and substance and virtue and valor. That's what it means to have the wealth of the sinner transferred to you. You get all these things. You have an, a, another interpretation of it. says calls it an army. And what it means is this. Every single thing that you could ever need in your life to be prosperous will be given to you because you serve God, because you love God, because you put Him first, and because you trust Him with all your needs. So God is going to give you the wealth of the sinner. And to lay it up means to hide it, to hide it and leave it for you. Okay, but you have to go and grab it. You have to go and get it. You have to confess it over your life, but you have to be walking towards God when you're doing it. And you have to make sure that your heart and your attention is to glorify God and to build up his kingdom. Okay, we have to do things right. God has his his wealth and uh, his prosperity and his healing, everything set up in the Bible. But if we're not doing it right, we're doing it with the wrong motivations. We're going to miss out. We're going to have a lot of, of prayers that, you know, just apparently they fall short. And apparently when, well, when people have prayers of false story, they get discouraged. We've had people in this church that say, oh, I don't believe that God hears me. I don't believe that God answers prayers. And what did God do? He spoke through me to that person and said, word for word, this is what you said and this is what you prayed for. So God obviously does hear prayers, even when we think He doesn't. Now look at this next one. Psalm 103, verse 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. So God has benefits? Really? Did anybody know that God has benefits? Serving your God, yes, it's a life of servitude, but he comes with benefits. A lot of people don't want to serve God. Like, oh, they, it's because they don't want to give up their sin. But if they knew that the benefits outweighed the sin, they'll, they'll be all about Jesus. Because what he can do for you is much, much more than what you can do for yourself. But it comes out of a relationship of love. Not by treating God like a piggy bank. It comes out of a relationship of love. Just like I love my daughter, I give to my daughter, I give to my wife because I love them. They don't even have to ask. That's just my nature. God also has that nature too. He gives you the things before you need them because he knows you're going to pray for them. He says, I know you have need of things before you need them. He said, look at the birds in the air, look at the beasts of the field. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't do anything for my kingdom, but I provide for them. Aren't you not much better than they? Yes, we are. So just by default, just by being sons and daughters of the king, we're already blessed. He already provides for our needs. But when we pray, that's just icing on the cake, man. That's just even more so on top of that. Of course, we don't always pray to get. We always pray to give for God to intercede in our lives. But prayer, like I said, this is an act of worship to God, and it's used for everything under the sun, everything, for provision, for for warfare, for uh, healing, for everything you can think of, it's all done through prayer. And all prayer is, is a confession of your faith of what you believe in the Word of God. That's all prayer is, is a confession, a conviction of your faith. And you're saying it out loud, and you're saying, Lord, I know what your Word says, and this is what we're going to do. Amen? So, not only is it God's will for us to be prosperous and healthy, but it's also God's will for us to be thankful. A lot of people are not thankful when it comes to prayer. Thessalonians should be 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is what? The will of God in Christ Jesus concerning who? You and me. It is God's will for us to give thanks in Christ Jesus and in everything that we do. So in everything we do, we do to the glory of God, right? That's what the Bible says. Everything that we do to the glory of God. Why does he want us to do to his glory? Because if we're doing to his glory, that means we're happy about it. And if we're happy when we're doing it, that makes that prayer that much more powerful and that much more real. Because the word said it earlier, when you ask, believe that you have received. Meaning the moment the prayer left your lips, you believe, Lord, I got it. That instant, the moment I prayed, I got it. It's already manifested. It's a done deal. When you really believe that, guess what happens? 
joy comes into your heart. Especially if you said, Lord, rent's due tomorrow and I need a miracle. In Jesus' name, help me. Boom. The moment you said that, you should believe with all your heart that that check's coming in the mail any second now. And that is something that will excite you. So when you are excited about God's word, then that makes it that much more alive, that much more real. And that really is a secret to having your prayers answered is to believe what you're praying for. Because when you do really believe it, you get happy. You get joyful. You're like, wow, this is awesome. Like I am in a position in my relationship with the Lord that I know when I pray, it's, it's done. And I have no doubt about that. God has proved it to me over and over and over again. But I had to I had to work it out like a muscle. I had to pray and pray and pray. I, I live a prayerful life every day, all day long. And that's just that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's what you're supposed to do. But it's such a part of me. And it connects me to him. When I pray, I'm communing with the father. I'm spending time with my father. I'm talking to him. I say, Lord, you see what's going on here. How do you want to do this? I know what your word says, but what do, you, what do you want, Father? What do you need? How should I pray? And then I'll pray in the Spirit. I'll pray in the Holy Ghost. And then the Lord will say, all right, this is how I want you to pray. And then I pray. Man, prayer is deep, guys. Prayer is deep. And the deeper you get with him, the more revelation you get and the more miracles, signs and wonders happen, man. It's awesome. And that's all activated by prayer. Because prayer is how we engage with God. Now look at this. Here's another thing you might not have known about prayer. Prayer is also a seed that you sow. Did you know that? It's a seed that is sown in fertile ground. And where's that fertile, fertile ground? The throne room, right? Because he's the one who answers the prayers. And it's really important because God's word will not be returned void. Look at Isaiah 55.10. It says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not thither, but waters the earth and makes it bring forth and bud, that that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not be returned to me void, but it will, it will absolutely 100% accomplish that which I please, which is what? His will. So if we're praying God's will, God said, hey, my word's not going to be returned void. If you said it, it will come to pass. Why? Because it's my word and I back up my word and I will make sure that my word is watered and it grows. And it says, and it will prosper in the thing where I have sent it. So where does he send it? To our lips, to our hearts, to our minds, to the word of God. So we get, we, we get the word of God. We get, we get the seed from here. We plant it in our mind. We plant it in our heart. And we speak it forth. He says, when you speak it forth, it will prosper. It will prosper. Amen? This is our manual. This is our word of God. This is our promises. This is our weapon. This is what we used to slap the devil with. And this is what we used to slap cancer and diseases and illness. This is what we use to be who we are in Christ, which we have victory over everything in the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Look at this. We're going to combine everything we've learned so far about prayer. And we're going to see what the anatomy of prayer actually looks like, everything we've talked about. So what's the first thing we're supposed to do? Well, first big thing. We ask according to His will. This is number one. So First John... 5.14 says, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us whatsoever we ask, we know, we know that we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Why? Because we're asking according to His will, and God's will is His seed, and He waters it, and He makes sure it grows, and God's word will not be returned void. Now look at this in James 4.3. It says, you ask... And receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So we know that as long as we're asking with the right motivations and the right heart, we'll always be in God's will. And the prayer will always be answered. So number one, asking according to His will. Number two, ask with humbleness. We don't want God to resist our prayers. How do we resist our prayers? By being prideful. Because God says, I resist the proud and I give grace to the humble. So if you've prayed to God out of anger and frustration, He resists you. You're not going to get what you prayed for. He's resisting you. We cannot pray from a spirit of pride. We can't pray from a spirit of entitlement. We have to pray from a spirit of humbleness, knowing who we are before our mighty king. So we take a knee before God our Father, and we acknowledge that He is the one who blesses us. It's by His hands that we prosper. So we need to recognize, number one, that there's no entitlement on our part. He blesses us because He loves us. And we, show him, we come to Him with a heart of gratitude. And a heart of thankfulness. Because if we're not coming into a heart of gratitude, then we're going to get resisted. Why? Because we're being prideful. God resists proud but gives grace to the humble. So we ask with humbleness. First Peter 5.5 5, 
Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Why? Because God resists the proud and He gives grace to the humble. He says it again. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So if you're praying and you're being prideful in your prayer and your chances are you're not getting your prayers answered. Or that or you're not getting what you prayed for. Now look at James 4.10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Then He will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Then He will answer your prayers. Why? Because you have to remove the hindering spirit of pride out of the way and say, God, I'm sorry. I've been frustrated with you. I know I've been yelling at you a lot lately and blaming everything on you. And I'm just sorry, Lord. I'm frustrated. Please forgive me. Look in my heart, Lord. This is what I need in my life. And Father, however you want to do it, I trust you. I trust you, God. Just have your way in me, Father. I yield to you. And guess what happens? And I feel the Holy Spirit on me right now. He moves. He says, now that's a prayer, son. Why? Because it came from your true heart. It came from a heart of repentance. It came from a heart of love. And it came from a heart of gratefulness. And when we do that, God moves, man, like wildfire. And he moves hard and he moves fast. And he moves heaven and earth to answer that one prayer. Because it was spoken correctly. It was spoken in his will. It was spoken in humbleness. And it was spoken with us considering the, the heart of the Father. You hear what I'm saying? We put him first. So what's the third thing? Well, the third thing we do is we have to ask with thankfulness and gratitude. Everything I had been saying just a while ago. This is Ephesians 5 and 20. Now we have to ask with thankfulness and gratitude because praying is a seed that you sow. So you want to sow it with joy. You want to sow it with victory. You want to sow it knowing that you know that God's got your back. Okay, that's a good seed right there. Ephesians 5.20. It says, speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So already right now we see that this person is just happy. He's singing, he's dancing, and he, everything's good. And he's giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'll tell you what, before you ask anything of God, before you go to God in prayer, why don't you do what Ephesians 5.20 says first? Why don't you do all that? Why don't you dance to God? Why don't you glory God? Sing to Him. Get on your knees and worship Him. Cry out your heart to Him. Just love on Him and just worship Him and praise Him. And just tell Him how awesome and how beautiful He is. And then go and pray. Then make your petition made known to God. Because if you do that, you won't be, I promise you, you will not be praying from a spirit of pride. You will not be praying from a spirit of fear, worry, or doubt. You'll be praying from a spirit of humbleness and a spirit of power. And your heart and your mind will be right with God. And He will answer that prayer. I guarantee it. I've been there before. Now check this out. Look at the next one. Colossians 3 and 16. He says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. Singing with grace in your hearts to who? To the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word, anything you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus while you're giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Do you see this heart right here he's talking about? This is the heart that honors God, guys. This is a heart that loves Jesus, loves the Holy Spirit, loves God. Church, this is the kind of heart that the Lord loves. This is the kind of heart that he wants to see when you come to him in prayer. This is the kind of heart that gets prayers answered. Amen? Everybody can see that? God's love is what moves the things on the earth. It's what makes the world go round. It really is. Love is the key, the secret ingredient to all happiness in life. And I'm not talking about fleshly love. I'm talking about agape love. I'm talking about love from the Father. The love that melts every concern and every worry, every doubt completely away. The kind of love that you feel like you're on cloud nine and you never want to come down. That's an awesome kind of love. But Christians should be known for that kind of love. Not fleshly love, godly love. The kind of love that tears down strongholds. The kind of love that tears down strongholds of the mind, of the flesh. Healing people. That's what love does. Amen. And that's what we're supposed to walk in. Now check out this next one. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We know it's our will to come to Him in a thankful heart. Right? Amen. So number four. We are to... Ask with faith and expectation. This is so important for you to ask with faith, but also expectation. And this is why faith and expectation go together. Because if you have faith, you will expect, right? 
If you have faith, you will expect an outcome. If you have no faith, guess what? You're not going to have expectation. And if you don't have expectation, you can forget about that prayer. Do you see how those two go hand in hand? Just like, you know, if there was a bonfire outside, you know that if you have faith to stick your hand in that fire, you better have faith to know you're going to get burned. Because that's what happens. You have the expectation. I stick my hand in the fire. I know I'm going to get burned. Well, let's not do that, but instead, let's take our, our hand into the Word of God and stick our hearts and plug into the Lord and ask in faith the things that we need. And we ask it in love. We ask it in humbleness. And we ask it with expectation because we know that God is going to come through. Amen? So ask with expectation. Now look at this. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not any man think that he will receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man, a person who is not asking in faith, they have no expectation. So they can't make up their mind of whether or not God's going to answer their prayer. So, well, well, I asked him according to his will, but man, I, I just don't know if he's going to answer me. That person is double-minded. That person is unstable. That type of person does not get his... Even though he was asking according to the will of God, he doesn't get his prayers answered. Why? Because he does not have the faith and expectation. Okay? And it says here that let, don't let that man think that he will receive anything from the Lord. Now, it doesn't say that God wasn't going to give. He just said he wouldn't receive. So if God's giving and we're not receiving, that means somebody's stealing. And guess who the stealer is? The devil. He's able to rob you of your blessing. Okay? Now look at this next verse. Matthew 21 and 22. It says, and all things, whatsoever you desire or whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing and you shall receive. Remember, we have to believe in what we're asking for. He says, if we believe, then we'll receive. Mark eleven twenty four. He says, therefore, I say unto you, what things uh, soever you desire. Again, it's the same scripture. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So you have to believe. You have to have that expectation. Now, what's number five? What's the fifth thing in the anatomy of prayer? Pray fervently, fervently. Now that word means to be active, to put forth power and effort, meaning with gusto to believe. I mean, you've heard me pray fervently. You've heard me pray with power, with, with conviction. So when you pray, that's how you pray. You're like, oh, you just get down on your hands and knees and let's do this. You know, that's, that's the motivation you want to have when you come uh, to prayer before the Lord. Now, James 5.16 says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It does a lot in the kingdom of God. Uh, Psalms 34.17. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That means, God, guys, no matter what's going on in your life, you're made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And no matter what's going on, the Lord hears you and he delivers you out of all your troubles. Now, I had an experience with this before. Um, I don't know how many of y'all have ever heard this story, but a long, long time ago, and I'll just get to the shortened version of it. Before I was saved, I had a woman go to Mexico, get a whole bunch of witches and put a curse on me. Okay? And over the course of 10 years, it affected my health and my mind, and I was just running with the devil. But it, I had horrible nightmares. I'd wake up with marks on my body. And long story short, I came to the Lord got delivered of that, came to salvation, and I was sitting down one time meditating on the Word. And this is the scripture that I was praying in my spirit. I was meditating. I said, Lord, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all the troubles. Father, I know you've delivered me out of all my troubles. I know you've got my back. I know and I thank you for delivering me from all this. And then I got taken away in the spirit and I had another experience. And I'll tell you that experience later. But when I came back, I was praying in the spirit. I heard this screech. It was the witches who had put a curse on me were just screaming and crying out in agony saying, stop saying that, stop saying that. They were just yelling at the top of the lungs. And I heard this like in 3D sound. I don't know if you guys have ever been in the spirit before. But when you're in the spirit, colors are brighter and sound is, has depth. Sound is like 3D. It's like, I don't even know how to explain it. It's maybe 4D or 5D. But you, can, you feel sound. It's all around you. It's like stereo, but here here, here, here. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. So I heard this, and the Lord said, these, these are the people who put that curse on you. And this is what, how I'm dealing with them. And so it's a, a testimony I'll give you on a much longer story. But when I got hunkered down in prayer, and I was praying God's will, because it's His will for His righteous people to be delivered. 
It's His will. And I prayed out of a spirit of humbleness and meekness and thankfulness and trust and knowing that He was going to deliver me. And He did deliver me. He delivered me from all of that. But what you're, what I'm, the whole reason of that little story is that what you're doing has a spiritual impact on your life. A spiritual impact. It's not just something that it's right here in this room and it stays there. Prayer goes out. Okay? It goes out into the Spirit because everything is done in the Spirit. We don't, we don't do things in the natural. We do things in the Spirit. And praying is spiritual. Amen? Now look at this next verse. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. So we know that we pray fervently. We pray without ceasing for anything and everything because the effectual prayer of a, of a righteous man avails much. The effectual fervent prayer. Now what's the sixth thing we do? Here's the power. Asking in the name of Jesus. Right? Because His name is the one we have power in. Right? Amen? So John 14 and 13, it says, Whatever you ask in my name, in Jesus' name, that will I do, that the Father, so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 16, 23, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whenever he says verily twice, you know it's important, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Remember, Jesus is the one who bridges the gap between us and the Father. Jesus is the one who made it possible for our prayers to get answered. He's the one who made it possible for our, to have our prayers in the very throne room. Not any saint, not any statue, not the Virgin Mary, Jesus and Jesus alone. Why? Because Jesus is the only one who died on the cross. He's the only one who suffered for us. So in His name, we have that power. Because of His blood, we have that right to go into the throne room of the Father and make our petitions made known unto Him. We just got to go with the right heart. Amen? So why is it so important to pray in the name of Jesus? Well, I just told you that. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one meteor between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. He's the only one that suffered and died for us, and he's the only one who deserves that role. Amen? So number seven. This is the most important one. Right here, guys, what I'm about to tell you, the seventh part of the anatomy of prayer, this is the most crucial, if you get all those other ones right, but you fall short on number seven, your prayer will, your prayers will more likely not get answered or you won't get exactly what you wanted. Here's number seven. Be patient. Be patient. I cannot stress enough. You got to be patient. People don't want to hear that when they're in a pinch. You can't tell me to be patient. You have any idea what's going on in my life? I say, yeah, I know. And now's not the time to flip out. Now is not the time to, to lose control and have a spirit of fear dominate you. Now is the time to trust God more than ever. You have to be patient. Now look at this in Psalms 27, 13. This is uh, David talking about. He says, I would have fainted and passed out and died unless I had believed and known to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. He says, wait, I say, on the Lord. David was obviously waiting a really, really long time. He says, God, if I didn't know you, if I didn't trust you, if I didn't know you always answer prayer, uh, prayers, I'd have thought you'd given up on me. I'd have thought that I wasn't going to get my prayers answered. I'd have thought you closed the door on me and ran away. But I know better than that, God. I know you answer prayers, and I know it's in your perfect timing. So what is David saying? He said, God, be patient, guys. You've got to wait on the Lord. He's the one who will renew your strength. Just wait on Him. Just keep confessing the outcome. Keep confessing the truth, the Word of God over your life, over that situation. Whatever it is, you keep confessing it every single day until it comes to pass. And then you just continue praising because you should have been praising beforehand. Because when you are confessing the truth, you're praising. Oh, Lord, thank you for that house. Or thank you for, for healing so-and-so. Thank you for this. Thank you for that. You call things that are not as though they are. Even though you don't see the manifestation of what you prayed for, even though you don't see it, you act like you have it. You get what I'm saying? You act like you have it because that's what makes it real. That's what makes it real. That's what makes it come to pass because if you act like you have it and you really believe it in your heart, then guess what's happening? You had faith and you had expectation. Expectation makes it real. Amen? 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 Now look at this. Look at this next one. Romans 15.4. And it said, for whatever things were written aforetime, whatever things were written before, were written for our learning. We're supposed to benefit from every single word in the Word of God, not just the New Testament. So that we, would, that we through patience and comfort of these scriptures, can have hope. So we can look at David and say, God, Lord, I'm going through this persecution right now. But look at David. He went through this horrible stuff. 
this king you had. He was a very imperfect man, but you still said he was a man after your own heart. You delivered him out of all these troubles. As much as he messed up, God, you still delivered David. Father, that gives me hope. That encourages me. Because if you did it for David, you'll do it for me. And why? Because God, you said you're not a respecter of persons. So I know if you did it for David, you're going to do it for me. Am I preaching to somebody right now? Amen? Amen. Amen. If he did it for David, if he did it for those Old Testament uh, people, he's going to do it for you. God is no respecter of persons. Okay? We don't get rewarded on, 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 a, on a level of holiness. We get rewarded on who he is and who Christ is in us. He's the one who was perfect. And we have the blood of Jesus. We have way more now than what David did back then. We are more blessed now than what he was back then. So if David got blessed the way he did, as imperfect as he was, don't you think we have even a bigger blessing? Amen? So what do we have to worry about? What do we have to be fearful? We don't. We just have to trust our Father. We just have to trust Him and be patient and wait on Him. Now look at James 1.4. He says, But let patience have her perfect work. Let patience have her perfect work. Meaning, hang on. Let this all come to pass. Let what you have prayed for, let it, let it stir up. Let the juices fill up. Let it marinate a little while because when it's done and it comes out of the oven, it'll be perfectly cooked. But if you take it out too early, it's not going to taste that good. It's going to be a little rough. won't be exactly what you want. But if you let it cook, you let it marinate, let patience have a perfect work, then you will be perfect and entire wanting nothing, meaning you will have exactly what you prayed for. You will be wanting nothing. You will have no lack at your, in your life at all whatsoever. Why? Because you were patient enough to trust God and to wait on Him and to get His best. Not your best, but His best. And that is an awesome thing. And that's how the anatomy of prayer works in our life. So the most important thing to remember about prayer is that it's an act of worship, God. It's our relationship. Okay? That's how we relate to God. That's how we commune with Him. That's how we talk with Him. That's how we grow with Him and with others. It's a tool made to grow people together and to grow us together in Christ. And it's an act of worship that reveals your love, your trust, your faith in God to help in a time of need. So I'm going to close by, I'm going to, by asking one more question. How do we get to the point to have all the faith that I'm talking about? How do we get to the point where we can have a powerful prayer life? How do we get to the point where we know that the moment the words leave our lips, they're going to get answered? How do we get to that point? Who wants to know that? How, how, do we, how do we know that? Seriously, everybody listening on YouTube, how do you get to that point where your faith is just on autopilot and your prayers just get answered one after another after another and all doubt is removed? Doesn't everybody want to get to that point? Everybody wants to have a prayer life like that. Amen? Because we need that prayer life. This is how you do it. Number one, you rightly divide the Word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study, study, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. When you are rightly dividing God's Word, that means you're being diligent about studying His Word, and you're rightly dividing it. mean, who is God talking to? Who is this promise meant for? What's the purpose? And what covenant is it in? Is it the Old Testament covenant? Is it the Adamic covenant? The, the Mosaic covenant? The Abrahamic covenant? Or is it the covenant of Jesus? Who is He talking to? What's this all about? So you have to know what the Word of God is, is talking to. Who it's talking to. Who it's for. Because that makes all the difference in the world. Because you may be reading something in the New Testament that was talking to unbelievers telling them they're about to go to hell for this sin and this sin and this sin. And if a safe person thinks that that person is talking to the church, guess what? That person thinks, oh man, I'm going to hell because of sin. I thought I was saved. See how that messes people up? That's why you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? Now, what do we do with that truth? Once we get that truth, what do we do with it? This is what we do with it. Listen, this is what you do with the truth. This is the icing on the cake. You use it to renew your mind. Once you get that truth, once you have studied and properly divided the Word of God, then you get that truth and you start chewing on it. Okay? You, start, you put it in that oven in your mind. You let it bake in your mind. You let it bake in your heart. You let it bake in your flesh. You let it bake on your tongue. And this is what it looks like. Romans 12, 2. It's be not conformed to this world. So immediately you need to put the foolish things of the world off to the side. But instead of being conformed to the world, to the lies of the world, instead of being conformed to the doctor's report, instead of being conformed to the, to the fact that you have no job and you can't pay your bills, instead of being conformed to that, instead do this. This is what he's talking about. Instead, do this. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind 
so that you can prove what is good, what is acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And the perfect will of God is everything that is in the Word that is promised to you, made available through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's what God's perfect will is. It's not the circumstances of the world. That's not God's perfect will. That's the devil's perfect will to destroy you. The perfect will is for God you to be delivered from diseases, to be delivered from poverty, to be delivered from brokenness, to be delivered from strongholds in your mind, to be delivered of all that, and to be set free. That is God's perfect will, and that is in His promises. That is written in His Word. So when you renew, when your mind is renewed to God's Word, your prayers can literally move mountains. They become powerful. They become a force to be reckoned with. But more importantly, when your mind is renewed to the truth, you're in God's perfect will. You're in God's perfect will. And by experience of being in God's perfect will, you're able to prove what we're talking about, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God in your life. And when you do that, when you prove it, you're proving that His Word is true. You're proving that His Word is good, and you're proving that His Word is perfect. Then, once you get to this point... Something awesome happens. Once you get to this point, John 8.32 becomes more real to you than it ever has been. Anybody know what John 8.32 is? When you get to the point where your mind is renewed to the Word of God and that you know that the moment that those words leave your lips, God's answered that prayer. When you get to that point, this is what happens. John 8.32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.